forced every member of Congress to decide what they think about Asia. And um, particularly after Japan and, and, and the U.S. began serious negotiations in the, um, in, in the aftermath of, uh, or in the wake of Prime Minister Abe's February 2013 visit. And there was a sudden interest in Congress in Asia. And it wasn't just because of security problems in the South China Sea. It was because every member of Congress had to decide what they thought on a sensitive political vote about how important Asia was. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of interest. So it's, it, it has also changed, I think, the U.S. Uh, experience um, thinking about Asia and our, and our stakes in the region. Um, let me ask you a quick follow-up. The, the J JETRO and also JBIC, Japan Bank for International Cooperation, surveys show that um, Japanese overseas um, uh, direct investment has essentially dropped in half in China the last two years each year and essentially doubled into Southeast Asia, especially the so-called ASEAN plus one, Vietnam, uh, India, which is not in this, uh, Indonesia and so forth. Do you think that um, membership in TPP uh, will affect investment decisions by Japanese companies going forward? Do you think you know, there will be some diversion um, depending on who is in and not in TPP uh, within Southeast Asia? Well, thank you, Michael. Um, the, uh, as um, Mr. Ishiga's uh, presentation explained, uh, some of the reasons why uh, you know, the uh, Japanese investment had been you know, uh, diverting, uh, maybe uh, one of the uh, uh, economic uh, factors uh, is that uh, the raising uh, labor cost and uh, raising or increasing uh, labor cost in China is uh, quite phenomenal particularly in those coastline cities. So uh, maybe that's a kind of a very politically neutral sort of uh, uh, factor why, you know, Japanese investment had been, uh, uh, had been uh, decreasing uh, to, to China. Um, but at the same time, you know, the uh, Japanese uh, companies are now engaged more and more uh, uh, not only uh, within the region, uh, you know, uh, uh, production networking or uh, value chain uh, to more kind of wider context. It's a wider sort of spectrum of, uh, uh, you know, value chains or uh, production network. So uh, um, Japanese companies are not only looking at TPP. TPP certainly, you know, uh, in terms of maturity of uh, negotiating result, negotiating results, it's really the most important element. But also Japan, EU, JCK, RCEP, all of these are being, you know, connected uh, to the eyes of Japanese companies, and they would like to have uh, more kind of uh, uh, well integrated uh, world value chain that they would like to realize through those respective uh, inter-regional mega FTAs. That's how I look at that issue. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Professor Zhang, I want to ask you two questions. But um, first, uh, let's say TPA passes this week, and maybe we have a TPP signing ceremony in, um, in uh, Manila for APEC in November which, by the way, is CSIS experts speculating. I don't think there's been any official announcement along these lines. Um, however, CSIS speculation is 80% probable, I'd say, wouldn't you, Scott? So um, let's just assume uh, um, that this moves forward with APEC. What do you think the impact will be in China's own debate about reform and free trade agreements and uh, international economic cooperation? In China now, <clears throat> I saw a biggest uh, uh, exporter in the world, as well as the second biggest economy. Uh, meanwhile, China today is a, a world's manufacturing center, so promote both trade and investment liberalization and facilitation that will benefit for China's development in the future. That's why now China is making a lot of efforts to promote and try to create our you know, regional trade agreement network uh, you may find that in recent years, not only on the platform of APEC, APEC, but also in Latin America and in EU, you may find that more and more new free trade agreements uh, has been signed. Also this year, China-Korea, China-Australia uh, will be the uh, two new ones. Uh, uh, meanwhile, in, along, you know, belt and roots, also you may find that uh, China-Sri China, Lanka, China-Israel, now uh, is discussing how to promote you know, bilateral free trade agreement, agreement. even if between uh, China and uh, you know, uh, uh, Euro-Asia economic community, you know, 
uh, concentrated Russia and uh, those former Soviet Union uh, economies. Uh, between this community and China, now we already started to dis discuss, you know, the future free trade agreement. So I think that, generally speaking, uh, China will uh, promote this type of, you know, framework, and then uh, China's economic transition uh, will be, you know, uh, will be achieved. Uh, meanwhile, China's uh, huge market potential and China's uh, high growth rate will be shared by other economies in the world. But regarding to TPP, uh, China's attitude is quite clear. That is, uh, we are very happy to see uh, those TPP members can make consensus because we think that uh, TPP will be a possible approach for promoting Asia-Pacific economic integration. On the other hand, we also realize, uh, realize that uh, there is uh, you know, a gap between China and TPP. Uh, China needs to reform and open up further. And maybe uh, in the long run, we can discuss you know, uh, uh, what will be the possible scenario for Asia-Pacific economic integration. But for AFTAP you know, goal, uh, last year here, I uh, talking about my points. I, I said that uh, in the future, you know, there will be maybe quite different approaches to AFTAP. One is maybe possible TPP because from Japanese side and from the U.S. side, you hope you know China and Indonesia, this type of country can join TPP. But you know that for China and for Indonesia, maybe we will feel. Uh, too, you know, uh, we will not so comfortable, you know, for TPP because the TPP high standard and uh, you know very strict regulations maybe to some extent surpass the development stage for those developing economies in the region. That's why now we are making efforts to promote RCEP. In the future, maybe for developing economies, they prefer to choose RCEP, you know, a track. The third possible approach will be, you know, maybe TPP track and uh, RCEP track, they can work together to innovate a new template. That also would be possible. Uh, so what will be happened in the future? That's why a strategic collective study need to be, you know, conducted by all economies of APEC. So I, I think that uh, the, a practical approach needs to be studied and need to be explored in the future. An excellent suggestion. And let me ask you now about the One, uh, one uh, Belt, One Road, and Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, these are new for China. Uh, it's a new experience. It's a lot of money. Um, it's uh, investment in areas that are not altogether stable or well-governed. Um, and um, it's um, an international institution um, that China has never had the experience managing before. So as you look at the um, One Road, One Belt, and AIIB um, initiatives, uh, what are the areas that you think will be the most challenging for Beijing? And other possibly areas where we can cooperate to address those challenges? Yeah. Uh, at the beginning, I'd like to uh, correct one uh, concept that is uh, today in China, you know, our officially uh, name of, you know, one, not One Belt, One Road, our initiative. Actually, the formal uh, name is uh, the Road and Belt Initiative because, you know, that uh, One Belt and One Road, this concept is too narrow. Uh, we just borrow, you know, the, con uh, the oldest, uh, you know, co concept uh, in, in the past. But today, you, you, you may find that actually there will be many roads and many belts. They can formulate a network, economic network, you know, covering, uh, you know, Asia, Europe, and Africa. So based, based on this type of, you know, understanding, we think that uh, uh, the Belt and the Road Initiative. This is, uh, you know, uh, this this, is, this concept is more exact. Uh, for China, we realize that if we, if we want to promote this type of initiative, the challenge is, is very big. You may find that along the routes, so a lot of country economies actually belonging to poor country, 
and uh, their per capita GDP may be you know, below uh, 5,000 US dollars and very poor infrastructure and very bad you know, env investment environment. So that's why you know, uh, faced with this type of situation, we think that uh, because in the past, China experienced this type of status. So we know, you know that in China, we have our two valuable experiences. One is uh, if you want to be rich, the first thing is to pave road. This is the first one. And the second one is uh, if you want without industrialization, you will not be rich. And uh, based, on the, based on these two you know, experiences, that's why now we need to have our you know, AIIB and the Silk Road Fund to make efforts uh, in, uh, in the field of infra infrastructure uh, improve, improvement. Uh, of course, in that process, uh, you may find that uh, even if we can have AIIB, even if we can have another, you know, 100 billion US dollars from Japan. You know that personally, I think that AIIB promoted Japanese government provided another uh, 100 billion US dollars. So this is constructive role promoted by, uh, played by AIIB. But even like this, you know that actually faced with uh, trillion dollars levels demand, you know, in Asia, you may find that uh, uh, 100 billion US dollar still not enough, plus AIIB, 200 uh, uh, billion US dollars also not enough. In the future, we need maybe three, four, five, this type of, you know, more and more fund. That's why we have to introduce, you know, PPP model, because uh, in the future, we have to promote uh, infrastructure uh, improvement uh, by both, you know, public participation and private participation, especially, you know, social capital uh, will be critical, you know, for infrastructure uh, if improvement. If you look at China's, uh, you know, experiences in the past, uh, BOT model and the BT model, you know, this type of PPP model has already been very popular in different fields for in, in the field of energy projects, uh, highway projects, uh, yeah, even if, you know, uh, high-speed train projects. Yeah, so I think that uh, PPP model also will be critical for both APEC cooperation and, uh, you know, uh, one belt and one road initiative construction. Thank you. So if the model is going to be to expand the funds available for infrastructure to have public-private partnerships, you're going to have to have um, a governance model that's transparent and predictable. And um, that's, uh, of course, one of the areas of concern for the U.S. and for Japan about AIIB. Um, let me conclude before we turn to questions by asking Matt and then Watanabe-sensei. Um, is there room for us to work with China on governance? I don't think the U.S. will likely join anytime soon yeah. for reasons with our Constitution, yeah. uh, the, the Congress, I don't think, will go for it. But are there, is there a role for us to help with governance uh, or set some expectations? And, and then also, Watanabe sensei, will Japan join? So yeah. you want? Oh, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, I was asking okay. them, but please. You. Actually, uh, in recent years, you may find that uh, as some member of WB and ADB, also uh, China has our own uh, you know, China Development Bank as well as China Exam Bank. They already become, uh, you know, international player in global market. In that process, I think that uh, China has already realized that uh, anti-corruption, transparency, a uh, good governance, very critical for you know international uh, development uh, uh, projects. For AIIB, I do believe that uh, China's direction also will follow those international you know financial uh, rules. On the other hand, we also realize that uh, today WB as well as ADB, actually their efficiency has a problem. So how to you know, balance uh, these two aspects? I think that uh, AIIB maybe will explore. For I do believe that uh, transparency and governance uh, will be respected by AIIB. 
And also, recently, you may find that the new chapters of AIIB will be released. You may find that some of detailed regulations will follow you know, international rules and regulations. Yeah. From this point, uh, from this regard, I think that uh, in the future, in case that uh, both the U.S. and Japan can join, and then you may make rules and regulations better, you can improve, you know, governance and, uh, you know, uh, transparency. Thank you. I mean, it's an interesting point when you look back at uh, Japan's proposal for an Asia monetary fund in the midst of the 1997-98 financial crisis. That proposal was essentially pushed into uh, an IMF uh, framework, but um, it did um, uh, provoke debates within the IMF and the World Bank about efficiency, um, and in, in that sense did have a kind of positive role. So maybe the AIB will you know, spark those kinds of debates. But Matt, and, and then Watanabe Sensu, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, um, so I, I think, first of all, the United States, you're right, will not join this bank um, for the indefinite future. Again, I think Congress is unlikely to approve uh, multi-billion dollar funding for a Chinese-led bank. That just seems to me politically unrealistic in the near term. Um, and secondly, the U.S. lost a lot of credibility uh, by the way it handled uh, this issue, and so we don't need to revisit all of that because uh, even the White House, I think, acknowledges that now. <laughs> um, but uh, as a result, I think there are limits to what the U.S. can do to shape um, uh, the governance um, of this institution. Uh, but, uh, well, and one other thing, which is that I just would uh, confirm what uh, Dr. Zhang said, that the Chinese government and the, those involved with the AIB have, have made you know, strong assertions of, of an intention to be transparent and to govern this organization well, and there will be certain market pressures to do that. If they want this to be a bank with a credit rating that can raise money in the markets, there's going to be a lot of pressure to conform to sort of a, a set of standards. So I think for all those reasons, there is, um, you know, there is, there is some reason to take, take comfort. And on the other hand, you know, there are questions about uh, um, an institution that, you know, that is going to have such a dominant uh, role uh, from China, because China's made clear it's going to have veto power over this um, uh, organization. And, and at the margin, I think most loans are not going to be problematic, but every so often there's going to be a loan that is going to come along that is going to be problematic for other members of this uh, group, and, and I think they're going to have limited ability to shape that. Uh, so um, I don't think the U.S. is going to be able to influence that either, except as a bank shot through its uh, reliable G7 partners. Um, <clears throat> that's a joke, uh, given, given, uh, given how reliable they were uh, uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the strategy earlier. Um, but, uh, but seriously, I think there will be pressures from within, but it, it's, they're not certain. So I think there are, there are, there are some reasons to, be, uh, to, to, to wonder about um, how this is actually going to be run. And then th there are questions about the lending standards. I think, again, China is going to be under a lot of pressure, and there are going to be some incentives for it to conform, because it's not going to want to lend to projects that go awry you know, and create a huge environmental disaster or something, because they'll be criticized without and within this organization. So, um, but, uh, and I think there's a question about what, what international standards are in these areas, because each, we were talking about this internally at a, in a little thing we had uh, a few weeks ago, uh, that there are different standards, even for environmental standards and loans. The, the World Bank and the IFC have different standards. The China Development Bank and the China Export-Import Bank have different environmental standards, and of course those are different from the the World Bank and so forth. So there may be a place for all of us to get together and talk about these things. So we've actually been kicking around the idea of, you know, maybe in the G20, there ought to be some sort of new forum created uh, to, to talk about what are best practices for, um, you know, for infrastructure finance and, uh, and to try to come up with some common, at least understanding, if not uh, standards uh, in this area. So, uh, so I think that may be another place the U.S. can play. But, uh, but I think we've, again, it's gonna, we're going to have limited influence on this thing from outside. One more thing. Um, if it's the Road and Belt Initiative, then with baseball in the mind, then I would propose a new acronym, which is RBI, for this, uh, for this Chinese.
I'm, I was very glad that you mentioned about uh, this, uh, you know, the uh, post-97-98 uh, monetary crisis. Uh, Japan proposed, uh, you know, uh, Miyazawa initiatives or even creation of uh, Asian monetary fund. Uh, and uh, um, the, uh, the Japan's um, uh, approach then was uh, something to do with, you know, to uh, cooperate with uh, uh, United States uh, in the... Uh, um, Monetary crisis, uh, uh, you know, that, that was that took place 97-98. So uh, there's more of a cooperation-oriented approach that Japan took, whereas uh, uh, the um, uh, AIIB, I think the uh, uh, although I appreciate uh, very much uh, uh, the um, considerations given by uh, Chinese uh, authorities about the uh, you know scarcity of resource and abundant uh, need for uh, infrastructure investment but um, uh, I think the, uh, the there should have been more kind of uh, preparatory process to bring all the stakeholders in particularly those major stakeholders such as uh, United States and Japan into the project and um, uh, 110 billion US uh, US dollars uh, you know that was mentioned by uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, at one speech, but uh, this is uh, not. Uh, this should not be uh, uh, considered as a kind of number competition. You see, uh, in the same speech, uh, Prime Minister Abe mentioned about uh, uh, quality, quality of uh, infra investment. Um, he repeated this uh, word of quality seven times in the same uh, uh, speech. Uh, that, you know, try to give you the impression that uh, Japan should give priority to quality of uh, uh, infrastructure investment. Um, and uh, also, you know, those things such as uh, uh, the situation of the host country of investment with regard to uh, uh, democracy, with regard to uh, rule of law, uh, human rights, and also environmental uh, uh, situation. Uh, those things are very much important uh, when we uh, engaged, when we are engaged in the uh, infrastructure investment. So I think the, um, uh, the AIIB uh, should uh, uh, keep those elements uh, in consideration and also uh, transparency and the government of organization also that's a source of concern for Japanese authorities. Uh, for instance, a member of the board, uh, they do not have a permanent address in Beijing. Uh, it's not the case in ADB. ADB, all the members, uh, they stationed uh, literally in Manila, and they engage day-to-day -day sort of monitoring of the uh, management of that organization, ADB. So, um, uh, you know, we have some uh, preoccupation about the effectiveness of governance of that uh, organ new organization, AIIB. Uh, it's uh, you know the, we have been uh, we have been told uh, by press that uh, more than 25 percent or 30 percent of fund would be uh, provided by China, but that perhaps give uh, uh, quite something close to veto to Chinese authorities. And uh, of course now we have our Western democracies such as UK, France, Germany already supportive of AIIB, but they might get very marginal. Uh, percentage of share and uh, put together, uh, put all together, uh, even they cannot uh, formulate kind of a blocking minority uh, for uh, any decision that might be considered uh, not so appropriate for infrastructure investment. So that kind of thing still, you know, uh, worries us very much. Uh, so, um, you know, I think Japan and the United States uh, now um, uh, seemingly decided or determined to stay outside of the AIIB. But if, uh, you know, ADB and AIIB, if they can cooperate in the infrastructure investment, uh, that's already positive. And, uh, you know, maybe, you know, by the fact that that uh, Japan and the United States uh, remain outside of AIIB will help the uh, sound management of AIIB. In this way, Japan and the US uh, uh, contribute to AIIB by their own absence. Uh, thank you. Very zen. <laughs>
<laughs> so very quickly, I just wanted to add, uh, you know, what's happening on the ground with business in this environment that we're talking about. I, I see a new development in terms of infrastructure. There's an infrastructure committee with the committee leadership going specifically last week to Indonesia, to Jakarta, and, and recently earlier on in uh, 2015 going to the Philippines. Uh, earlier was mentioned about U.S. engagement in infrastructure area, and these are two new developments in terms of a very specific infrastructure mission where companies go and have a deeper dive into these topics such as infrastructure financing and public private partnerships. So this is, again, a, a reaction or part of what's happening while we're discussing these larger issues that are at hand. So just wanted to bring that into the discussion. Thank you. I, this is going to you know, watch this space. This is going to be a drama that will unfold. And um, I think there are two parallel things happening at the technical level. The, the, the people in the Chinese government who are responsible for um, creating this uh, new bank are serious economists and serious people with experience in the World Bank and are talking to experts uh, in international institutions and IFES and the bank and the Asian Development Bank and so forth. But at the same time, in China, this is an extremely political and strategic initiative. And the role of the leadership in China, the role of industry is very opaque still. And I guess we'll, we'll learn more as we go forward. Um, uh, let's take some questions. And um, if you could uh, briefly identify yourself. And uh, yeah, Scott. Microphone, Could, yeah, good. Thank you. Uh, Scott Miller, CSIS. Uh, I want to raise a, I don't know if it was a question or a thought experiment, but uh, the general impression from all the presentations and all the discussion is that economic integration in the Asia Pacific is some natural phenomenon that it proceeds almost automatically, it has only one direction to it, and you could come away with the idea that we're just like two or three acronyms short of nirvana. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And I, That's I just, the title of your next book. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, but I want to observe that on a global basis, that isn't the case. Uh, glo globally, the, the trade and investment as a share of world output today is below the levels achieved in 2007. We have not yet recovered in trade and investment from the Great Recession. Uh, also, I think you could observe regionally, you have some big economies, Matt mentioned this earlier, big economies that are either going sideways like India or going backwards when it comes to integration like Indonesia. All right. So the question is, and, and it just a panel reaction is, what policy would we recommend that is different if we presumed that this wasn't automatic, that we could sort of revert to the mean, that, 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 uh, that, that deeper integration is not automatic? How would our policy recommendations change if that were the case? Thank you. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Actually, I'd like to emphasize one point. That is international regional economic cooperation uh, does not mean you know, regional economic integration. By another words, today you will find that uh, uh, in this world, for WTO member, actually WTO could be regarded, uh, could regarded as uh, you know, primary you know, uh, free trade you know, uh, agreement. And you may find that uh, even today, more than 40 can economies in the world, they are not member of WTO, because WTO just have 160 members. And if you look at the map on the website of WTO, you may find that uh, a lot of countries concentrated in, you know, uh, uh, maybe uh, West Asia, and Central Asia, as well as you know, Africa, North Africa, they are not member of you know WTO. That means, given that they cannot become the WTO member, that means it would be very difficult for them, you know, to be involved in regional economic integration process. So, from this regard, I, I think that regional economic cooperation also should consider, you know diversified approaches and diversified policies. From this regard, I think that China's you know, Belt and Road Initiative can play you know, a constructive role on this aspect. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much uh, for a very insightful question, Scott. I really enjoyed that very much. Um, yes, uh, the um, uh, economic integration uh, in East Asia started uh, with uh, foreign direct investment. And I think the uh, ignition was uh, uh, Plaza Accord of uh, you know, September 1985, when Japanese yen being much appreciated, about 25%. Then, uh, you know, Japanese manufacturers uh, looking at uh, uh, Asia, particularly those, uh, you know, the top five, six of ASEAN countries, uh, because their national currencies have been uh, linked to US dollars. So that was the best way to, uh, uh, you know, avoid the, you know, the up and downs of the uh, uh, dollar yen exchange rate. So uh, that was the how you know FDI channeled into uh, those ASEAN countries, and uh, you know um, at, at the end we had the, this kind of uh, uh, production network across the, all the ASEAN countries. Now what we are being faced with is that uh, we are moving from that kind of de facto business-driven FDI-induced integration into more. Uh, you know, uh, institution-driven integration, uh, legally minded, uh, particularly with FTA. So I said that, uh, you know, the uh, ASEAN's mentality is uh, we agree first and talk later, but now this sequence has been changing. And also TPP has a major sort of influence on this. So that's uh, uh, one thing that I'd like to mention. We are getting into more institution-driven or maybe, you know, uh, dual oriented approach uh, to uh, this um, uh, integration things um, in, the, in the region of Asia Pacific. And I'd like to also uh, uh, refer to the uh, very concrete example of the uh, trade related investment measures. Uh, that's agreement in, uh, also incorporated into WTO. But TRIMS, uh, we have only four of the prohibitive performance requirements, such as you know, export import balancing requirement or the local content requirements and so forth. But uh, there are a lot more uh, you know, investment imp impeding uh, investment measures uh, performed by uh, host country governments. So uh, uh, we, we need to uh, look after all these uh, because, uh, as you said, you know, the trade and investment uh, so far not exceeded the level of 2007, maybe due to those uh, you know, uh, impediments. So perhaps uh, you know, we have to open our eyes to do, look at those investment-related uh, measures and bring into uh, you know, uh, bilateral FTAs or TPP, you know, mega FTAs, so that uh, we could uh, you know, uh, ameliorate, I mean, improve the situation uh, of the investment across the Asia Pacific. And perhaps with that experience, we can uh, move forward to the um, all multilateral uh, setting of uh, investment uh, in the near future. Thank you. So the short answer to your question is we'd be doing what we're doing, <laughs> which is reducing impediments to investment and trade, maybe with a little more urgency. Yes, sir. I, 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 whatever color that is. I have a question for Mr. Goodman. You made two statements. One is you said AIB is not going to happen because of the U.S. Participation will not be there. And then you, ask, you added something, a caveat. What is that we lost credibility? What is that that we lost? Uh, the, the U.S. lost credibility? Why, why did I say that? Beca because the U.S. Um, uh, tried to get a coalition of uh, countries, G7 plus, you know, Australia, Korea, to keep this bank at arm's length uh, and uh, failed to do that. Uh, Britain joined, and then there was a flood of, of other countries that joined. And so, uh, you know, in a, in a word, I mean, the U.S. was unable to achieve what it tried to do, which was to keep this bank at arm's length. So, so, um, and, and gave the impression that gave the impression that it was opposed to any sort of Chinese-led initiative, as opposed to. Uh, I mean, I think their big mistakes were they didn't a year ago go public with um, the following statement: We agree with China on three points. There is a big infrastructure need in the Asia Pacific. Uh, the current institutions are not filling that need. And we, uh, China has a lot to bring to the table, money, capacity, experience with these activities. And so the United States welcomes China's uh, desire to play a role in this. But do we need a new bureaucracy to address this problem? Is it a problem of money? 
uh, do we, uh, if we're going to have a new institution, how should it be governed, how should it lend, um, how should it procure? Um, and I think if we had done that publicly, we would have uh, been on much higher moral ground and might have actually ended up uh, swaying some, uh, some opinion on this, but we decided to remain silent and then gave the impression that we were, we were trying to pressure people not to join because it was a Chinese initiative. And then, you know, if you're going to do that, at least win, you know, at least, at least keep everybody on side. And, and we, we failed to do that. So, uh, you know, I think, I think it was, uh, that's what I meant. I think we don't have as much, uh, as a result of that, we've lost a lot of ground. Bureaucratically, I think Treasury was staring at Congress and making policy instead of looking at the region and thinking about what was actually happening and what outcomes we wanted, which, by the way, is exactly what happened with the U.S. response in the 1997 financial crisis. So, you know, two strikes, to use the baseball metaphors. Maybe next time, you know, we'll get a little s smarter. I think we can do one more, and I'm going to look to the wings, since I haven't called uh, on our flanks yet. Um, okay, back to the middle. Uh, Steve Winters, independent researcher. I'd like to direct this uh, to Director Zhang. Uh, to what extent does China view uh, the Road and Belt Initiative as uh, consistent with or an extension of the so-called hub and spoke model, where China is the factory floor of the world and so many of the supply chains uh, sort of move up uh, to China uh, for the final thing? Because if I look at the uh, transit and economic corridor that's proposed through Pakistan, which, which is really amazingly uh, you know, exciting, uh, it also sort of looks like another spoke, or could function as another spoke. Uh, definitely. Uh, uh, the first thing I'd like to say that uh, the Belt and the Road Initiative maybe will last for a few decades. Yeah, this is a long-term you know, initiative. Uh, because you know that if you look at uh, uh, in Pakistan, in India, uh, they, are per, they, they have a huge population, but their per capita GDP, you know, very low. And there is a very huge, you know, space for development in the future. Uh, regarding, you know, the corridors, not except, you know, China-Pakistan economic corridors, we also have another five, you know, corridors. Uh, within China, Mongolia, uh, Russia, and from China to Central Asia, and from China to Southeast Asia. Yeah, something like that. Everyone is a complicated <laughs> and a tough mission. And in that process, uh, you know that any international cooperation will be welcomed, such as, you know, ADB, and such as, you know, World Bank, such as other international financial development agencies will be welcomed. We can work together. Otherwise, you, you, we, we know that, we, we are very clear, only by Chinese uh, uh, itself, we cannot finish, you know, we cannot do this, top, this type of job. Of course, uh, I like to mention one point uh, that is, uh, you know, face with uh, TPP two years ago here, I just talking about a lot of Chinese people regarded the TPP as a conspiracy uh, made by the U.S. You know, face, facing with China's rising against the China's rising. At that time, I critic criticized this point. I said that uh, uh, the U.S. Uh, is not smart <laughs> because you know that uh, U.S. is not the member of P4. If you are the member of P4, that means you are very smart, but you, 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 you uh, uh, very regret uh, you, you didn't produce this type of good idea. But this time for AIIB issues, I also think that the uh, U.S. is not so smart compared with the EU. I hope that uh, maybe after a few years, uh, you, could be more, uh, you could be smarter a little bit. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Our stupidity will be our salvation. Uh, <laughs> on that note, thank you. Um, this is a great panel. A lot of rich.